Now, I'm not saying good morning to you because uh, I've already been introduced. But that was not always something that was passed over. At one time, if you said good morning, you were immediately suspected. You were, you were identified as somebody who doesn't toe the line. And that was a very difficult thing to be in Nazi Germany. I know this from my own experience because at the time I was living in Stettin and was attending the Nautical College there. I was sitting at the same bench that my father, who had also been a ship's captain, had been sitting. I saw that on the initials that he had uh, engraved in the, uh, in the desk. And because I did refuse to Heil Hitler, and you may know that this greeting ascribes salvation to Hitler, which as a Christian I couldn't do. Uh, when I say Christian, I mean the Bible forces at that time, and now Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, so because I didn't do it, because according to the scripture, in I think it's Acts 15, verse uh, 19, uh, there is no salvation in any other name but that of Jesus Christ. And uh, so when you didn't say hi to Islam, you didn't toe the line and you were suspicious. Well, I was eventually expelled from the navigation school because I refused to do this. And uh, I went first of all home I couldn't get a job or I couldn't earn any unemployment money as was then given very widely uh, because unemployment in Germany was enormous before it came. And when I started at the navigation school, a few months later Hitler came into a power and that changed everything. <coughs> now the consequences of this refusal at first were that I was expelled from the navigation school, couldn't get a job, worked at home for my mother, who then provided luncheon for local people. Uh, and I did the washing up then, and preparing vegetables and things like that to make it a bit easier for her. Then my uncle in Danzig, who heard of my uh, predicament, he and his wife also were Jehovah's Witnesses. He actually had a public house, uh, not a, 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 what we call a pub in English. And uh, uh, I served in the pub then for a, a few years. And then things changed in Danzig because of the Hitler government. Now, Danzig was a free city, which means she was not subject to any other government except the United, uh, the League of Nations at the time. And uh, when Hitler came into power, he gradually took over everything there. And because it was not under any jurisdiction of a higher power, that is to say, a, nat a national government, and it was the 
proving ground for some of the things that Hitler did in order to see if it's working or whether there would be too much protest from outside. So Jehovah's Witnesses in Danzig at that time had a very, very difficult and dangerous time. There is a book published by Franz Sosia, who was also a Jehovah's Witness, called Crusade Against Christianity, or the German title is Kreuzzug gegen das Christentum. And that described a lot of what went on at that time. And it, it's quite horrible to read, actually, these experiences. And uh, it brought home to me the dangers of what it meant not to go along with the Nazis. But Danzig was, as I mentioned, the proving ground for what Hitler tried to do. And so that was the reason why there was such a severe excuse me, such a severe persecution in Danzig. But the point is here that in everything that has passed, I saw the supervision by Jehovah God. Now that may sound strange to some who do not know very much about Jehovah's Witnesses, but to have lived through the experience is something that you do not forget. And this meeting here, facing the line, has brought this back to my mind. I had to think about things because they go completely out of your mind, and it's only an event like this that brings it back. Now, I'm so happy to be here on this occasion, and you will hear a lot of examples and experiences that will make you think again and will make you appreciate what can happen quite without any provocation just because of you not wanting to draw the line and do what other people who are evil thinking are likely to do. So I hope you will all look forward to the presentation here and enjoy what you are hearing. I'd like you to put yourself into the situation of a young girl of just 17 years old. And she was taken to court and sentenced not just to prison, but to solitary confinement. Can you imagine being in those circumstances? Now what crime do you think this young girl has committed? And what circumstances do you think led up to that event? Well, we have the privilege of speaking to that young girl right now. And we'd like to introduce to you uh, Magdalena Cusero Reuter. I'm sure you'd agree it's a privilege to speak to hear, to hear from her this morning. So I wonder if you could tell us about your background and your early family life. As we saw, we uh, were a family with 11 children, a happy family, a harmoniously family. You know? And my father, he loved us very much. He, looked, uh, he was concerned about everyone. We came home from school. He asked what happened at school and so on. But in that time, there were not yet television as they have today for the children. But then my father was very concerned to keep us uh, busy. And so everyone had to learn an instrument, music instrument. I studied violin and my sister's piano, everyone. And in the evening, we had a nice time. We made a concert, a family concert. And this was so nice, really a nice family life. That yeah. sounds a lovely, a lovely family yeah, life to yeah, be a part of. Yeah. And it was a big family, wasn't it, as we mentioned there? Six, six boys and five <coughs> girls. 
Right, that's lovely. And you had, um, you lived in a, a nice house, you had a couple yeah. of, uh, a bit of yeah. land. Yeah. And uh, the animals you used to look after, didn't you? We had some animals, a little dog, and uh, we had everything we needed. My father was, uh, uh, he was already retired because of the war. He was an of officer in the First World War One, and then he was a post officer, and he got pension, a good pension, and so we had everything we needed, really. And the most thing is we had this was peace and happiness. Well, that's lovely. That's very nice to hear, isn't it? Now, amongst your family there, what part would you say your biblical beliefs played in that? This was a big uh, part. In, uh, I think it's, uh, it didn't pass one day without any small uh, learning about the Bible. My father said, learn by heart some text of the Bible, so at the same time you learn good speaking, good reading, but never it was uh, like depressed, it was really happy. He uh, asked us some que question and it was really nice. That's lovely, yeah. So you were brought up all together and uh, would, uh, the one thing I was thinking of, did you feel pressured to believe what your parents believed or was it something no, you wanted to do? No, never. Uh, never we, f we felt, but we were so happy. My father came out of the First World War, there were, anyway, there were believers, there were uh, Protestants, but then he came out of the First war, World War, he, he was so, so uh, depressed, he said, what happened if there is a God, why do they kill one another? And then he was looking over, he looked in, in different, uh, uh, things, meetings, and then he visited once uh, a meeting of the so-called Bible students. He said, let's see what these people tell us. And then he saw there's something uh, what he loved, and he, uh, he studied, he informed uh, himself, informed, and then he teached us because he was very happy, and we were happy with him. That's lovely. That's, that's lovely to hear that. So it was an ideal, very happy and enjoyable family life. Now, could you tell us what was the turning point in your life? Was there a particular period where it changed a little bit? Or yeah, quite it a lot, changed drastically. drastically. Because then Hitler came to power and my father said, it seems that, like the Bible says, they will, uh, they will persecute Christian, really Christian, the true Christian, and there may be some they will uh, be killed, and so as a child I saw they will not kill uh, some out of our family, so I, I didn't uh, believe that. But uh, we saw the persecution at school, it started, I was about 12 years old, and then it was obliged to say hi Hitler, and my father explained from the Bible, as uh, uh, Mr. Sturm already mentioned in Acts 4, verse 12, that there is in nobody the salvation, because Heil Hitler, Heil means uh, salvation. And so uh, my father said, but this is up to you. You must not refuse to say Heil Hitler, because I tell it to you. And uh, so uh, I was really convinced. I wanted to please my God, and I said, I cannot do this. Well, that, that's nice to hear. And um, what pressures then, as things started to develop, were you put under in, in later life, perhaps at school? Yes, and I, I was thinking as well about your, uh, your little brothers and sisters as well. They were put under pressure, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, they denounced as a teacher, as we saw in the video. Uh, teacher Belport, he was uh, director of the school. The other teachers were very polite, but this he was a Nazi and a good friend with a uh, with a uh, priest, a Protestant, and he uh, put much pressure. He obliged us, he beat us, he w and then he denounced us. And one day came from the court that the children from Kosovo. They were really morally and spiritually neglected, yes. 
and so they have to take uh, to be uh, taken away from the parents to be really uh, uh, trained by the Nazis. Now, would you say that this, the description of Magdalena's family <coughs> sounded like a family that was spiritually and morally neglected? Well, definitely not, did it? And yet, that is what happened. And they were able, they, your little brothers and sisters were abducted, taken away from the school, yeah. weren't they? And in the same letter he told this, he said, but the Kusros are very obedient, they are very good, they never lie, and they have a good education but spiritually, morally neglected, yeah. But now, then, yeah. That, that's very nice, yeah. And, and it's, it's lovely to hear that even the your younger brothers and sisters, they were, what, what age were they at this time? They were quite young, weren't they? The, the, the little one was seven years old, and then I went already, I finished my school, and the three youngest, they were still in, the youngest seven years, the other uh, nine, and my sister Elizabeth, 13 and then the Gestapo came one day taking them away from the school bringing them into reform school or a reform house as we saw here. Yes, that's right. Now, now what was happening to you at this particular time period then? You were experiencing difficulties as well. Yeah, uh, then uh, between came the, another difficult time we couldn't learn anything uh, to, to study. Then I walked a little in a garden, garden, mm -hmm. yeah. but then we got the letter from my brother Wilhelm. In that time, it was nearly in the same year when my, my sisters were taken away from school. This Wilhelm was uh, uh, taken, he got uh, to go to the war, but he refused and then he was shot, he, he was condemned to death. And right after the, this, then we sell, I don't know if I should tell oh, you. Oh yes, you carry on. Then, <laughs> <laughs> then it uh, went off the persecution, the, the Gestapo came looking for research in the house and so on. But when I became 17 years old, and I thought now I will dedicate Anyway, I will dedicate my life to my God, to that Jehovah. That was your choice you wanted to do that, didn't My you? personally wish, never my father said, it is your decision. Don't do that because the father or the mother do that. But you, you have to decide. And I decided, and I was baptized with 16 years uh, old, and then uh, a couple of months later, the Gestapo came and took us the, the rest from the family from the house. Yes, and, and there was a time period there where you were left on your own in the house, wasn't there? Yeah, where everybody else had been taken that's away. True. How did I you was, feel then? I was 17 years, 17 years old, and the, the Gestapo came and took my father, my mother, and my sister Hildegard away. And they said, You are too young. You are too young for the prison, but I was too old for the reform school. Yeah. And so they left me home, sure, in that big house. I cried, I was alone. And then I went uh, to the prison in Paraborn. It was about 10 kilometers from Matthew Springer. And I went because I didn't know anything with pain and uh, anything. And then I said I wanted to speak my father. No, you cannot speak your father until you make her Hitler. And I said I have no money, and my father knows. And then they let, uh, I could speak with my father. He said uh, he gave me some checks to pay. He explained me something. But then I went home and I cried. But uh, two days later, it was about one week. I was alone in that big house. And then they took me away also into prison. So I was more quiet. I said, no, it uh, doesn't matter. I, I'm, at least I'm closer to my parents, to my family, although I didn't see them. Yeah, and, and there was a time as well where you, when you were put into prison, you were put in solitary confinement. That was what we were describing yes, earlier, wasn't they, it? Yes, they condemned me for uh, six, six months prison juvenile. And uh, we were already in penitentiary yeah. prison for uh, three months. They counted these three months and I, uh, they put me in this prison. 
I was three months, about three or four months in uh, alone in uh, and one small room. Yeah. Yes. Well, that must have been a harrowing experience to go through. Yeah. But it didn't end there, did it? Because uh, you, they took you away then to the infamous Ravensbrück. Ravensbrück, is that right? Yeah. yeah. When I, when the time was over six months, the supervisor called me. He said, "So tomorrow you can go home. I guess you are happy to come home." Yes. But I got a letter from the Gestapo. You have to sign a document that you never be, will be anymore a uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or a Bible student and so on. Then I said, I refused, of course, and I explained that I couldn't do that because then I, I was not worth to come anywhere into the prison. I could stay at home, but no, no, it's my decision. And then uh, the Gestapo took me, uh, I was still four months in, in another prison, uh, until I got 18 years old, and they <laughs> sent me to the uh, concentration camp Ravensbrück. Ravensbrück, yeah. very good. And, and while you were there then, that must, must have been a, a terrible time, because uh, you had perhaps thought you were going to be alone. Uh, can you just describe to us um, what it was like? I mean, uh, you, you were telling me about an experience about what it was like in the morning. The, the, uh, did they have a roll call? In the morning, yes, the roll call. I, I don't like to speak much about this because in television you see enough on these concentration camps. But in the morning we had to get up about 4 o'clock, 4.30, and then uh, we got some bread and, and some water, like coffee, and, so, and then to the roll call. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, the, uh, in the concentration camp, there were about 25,000 women, about 300 Jehovah's Witnesses. But until you got counted all this, sometimes the number was wrong, and so sometimes we had to stay in the winter, in the cold winter. We couldn't put the hands in the uh, pockets, and uh, sometimes three or four, sometimes five hours. Terrible, isn't it? Yeah. Now, what was amazing that while you were in Ravensbrook or Ravensbrook, um, you were trusted, weren't you, as one of Jehovah's Witnesses? Could you tell us what happened with regard to that? This, this was the last year. They noticed as we didn't sign this document, they know that we will not run away, and so they gave us some some uh, trustworthy work, so they trust us. And I was, uh, for example, in a house because the Nazis, the, the government brought all the families, their families close around the concentration camp. They know that they will not bomb this. And so they thought their, their family at least are more secure. And so they, uh, we, as Jehovah's Witnesses, the women, they sent us to a uh, housekeeper. And I was in one housekeeper. I guess I have here still my passport. We got a passport and we could go out of the concentration camp without any SS. I have it here still. This is the original. That's the original passport with yeah, your photograph on. My photograph, my, my photo, yeah. And then they say this uh, prisoner from the IBV, International Bible, uh, this. Uh, can go without any uh, any police or any SS out of the camp, can enter into the camp because she works with this SS Gruppenführer and so on and so on. This was and my first postcard when I came, when I sent me in in Ravensbrück. Sometimes they say they didn't know the, the uh, concentration camp, nobody knows. But at least the uh, post officer, he must know that it exists a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. And my sister, she got from all our family, from all the members, we sent to my sister to Berlin our letters from the concentration camp, from the prison, and so on. Because we could only write once in the month a letter. And so my sister, she gathered all she, uh, she wrote by typewriter with copies and send out us the information of the other members of the family. And the writing on, on that side, on, on the other side, what does that tell us? They say, uh, 
is prohibit uh, we cannot we cannot get we can only uh, write a little bit only once a month receive once a month but you maybe you refer on this letter the further letter this original letter only so it is six six lines and on back is here I have it in English maybe you can read it better than me. <laughs> yeah, this, this is written on this paper uh, in German. Yeah, the inmate can't... is still furthermore an obstinate Bible student and refuses to turn off from the Bible student's doctrine of or error. By this reason, the inmate is not allowed to carry out the normal correspondence. So you couldn't write what you could wanted. Could write only, only five lines, That's and the other could uh, write for for uh, lead. Uh, so because you were a very, a very dangerous Bible yeah, student. Yeah. Dangerous. <laughs> now, while this was all going on, um, you heard some very sad news about um, the rest of your family, what they were yes, enduring, yes, didn't you? Yeah, because he was shot. And right when I reached in Ravensbrück, before I reached, I don't know, it is good time. Okay. Because uh, before they sent me to Ravensbrück, my brother Wolfgang, he visited me. He said, Look at, I got a letter, I have to go to the war, but you have to count, he said, like Willem, maybe they will kill me. So we dismissed us. This was in February, and in March, we got already the news from other new uh, prisoners, our, our uh, sisters coming in, that he was beheaded. And our uh, <coughs> sisters in Face, Jehovah's Witnesses, see, uh, they gathered me, they said in the evening, uh, sit down, explained me that uh, my brother was beheaded. This was a very sad uh, news for me because we had such a nice family and he was such a happy boy, always, always uh, making humor and so, and then uh, from one to other day, this was not easy. Yeah, and that must have been a very difficult time. And um, can, I, can I just ask, was there any time period around then that did you ever feel like giving up your stand? No, never. No. Uh, when I saw he was so faithful, he was so faithful, then we will be at least also continue yeah. to be faithful. That's lovely, yeah. Well, we thank you very much for uh, those experiences and sharing them with us. Just one last thing I would like to ask you is, um, what message would you give to children and young people <laughs> who may suffer in the future because of their beliefs? I would say they never should follow any man or any person or organization. They, they should inform, inform themselves before they handle. And they should not forget, although we will not our Christian and moral value helps, uh, help us to know to maintain hate, but they should not forget it. And this exhibition is made not to forget. If we, if we would forget this, then we are condemned uh, repeating the same things. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Magdalena. Erklärung 1. Ich habe erkannt, dass die Internationale Bibelforschervereinigung ein Irrlehre verbreitet und unter dem Deckmantel religiöser Betätigung 
lediglich staatsfeindliche Ziele verfolgt. Zwei, ich habe mich deshalb voll und ganz von dieser Organisation abgewandt und mich auch innerlich von dieser Sekte freigemacht. Drei, ich versichere hiermit, dass ich mich nie wieder für die internationale Bibelforschervereinigung betätigen werde. Personen, die für die Irre der Bibelforscher an mich werden, herantreten oder in anderer Weise ihre Einstellung als Bibelforscher bekunden, werde ich unverzüglich zur Anzeige bringen. Sollten mir Bibelforscherschriften zugesandt werden, so werde ich diese umgehen bei der nächsten Polizeidienststelle abgeben. Vier, ich will künftig die Gesetze des Staates beachten, insbesondere im Falle eines Krieges mein Vaterland mit der Waffe in der Hand verteidigen und mich voll und ganz in die Volksgemeinschaft einliefern. 5. Mir ist eröffnet worden, dass ich mit meiner erneuten Entschutzhaftnahme zu rechnen habe, wenn ich meiner heute abgegebenen Erklärung zuwiderhandle. Unterschrift. This is Paul Gerhardt, the youngest one. Can you edit that bit? <laughs> he was after after the war, the, the brother from Babelsburg, <coughs> they visited him. He said, where is he, you young? He was with um, other parents. We adopt, they, they brought it to Nazi parents. And then the war was over, and the brothers were free. And they said, where is Paul Gerhardt Kusuro? Because the family Kusuro, they were not yet come home. And after 60 years, Paul Gerhard met his school colleagues, the school friends, uh -huh. again. And they wondered where Paul Gerhard is. They remember how strong he was. He didn't say I look like. And he met them all. And it came in the newspaper. And this was the house where the Golden Age read the Golden Age magazine. Oh, yes. Yes, that's in the uh, video. Yeah. And here's Simone Liebster. This was Gilead Klasse. Paul Gerhard is there in the Simone Liebster, one of his two. Paul Gerhard war in the Klasse. Gilead. In Gilead. Yes. And he was <coughs> And here's Brother Schröder and yeah, Paul one Gerhard. Young sister. This is well, my husband. Young sister. This was Not my anymore. husband. Not anymore. But she married also. And this was now in the uh, eighth. Also no more hands. The manche Schwestern have jemand geheiratet from in this the regierung. Yeah. They said this IBV Bib International Bible. Nein, nein, nein. Is a prisoner. He works in yeah. the house of an SS Gruppenführer in this organization in Ravensbrück. She can go free out. Uh -huh. And then it was renewed until 31 May. Postcard I had to arrive from the concentration camp when I reached in the concentration camp. Frauenkonzentrationslager Ravensbrück means women concentration camp Ravensbrück. I am here since 25 of February 1942 in concentration camp my address is Magdalena Kusuro, the number 9591 and so on, women concentration camp. And this was an open postcard written to my sister Anna-Marie Kusuro. She lived in Berlin. And so they said, women concentration camp, you must not have this, you must not send parcel. You think it's, it's, uh, under, it's prohibited. And this was another original letter. So here is something written that 
is only for Jehovah's Witnesses. They said, I have it translated here, they said, the inmate is still furthermore an obstinate Bible st student and refuses to turn off from the Bible student's doctrine of error. By this reason, the inmate is not allowed to carry out the normal correspondence. So we could only write five or six lines. That was it. The other could write four pages. And this is my brother Wolfgang. He was beheaded in 1940. He was buried just in the same month 20 years old he was. He was 25 years old. 25 years and he was uh, shot in Münster in Germany. That's lovely. Pardon? That's lovely. Thank you. So how did others uh, in the camp survive? Well, Max here is a natural Jew, Max Liebster, and now Katie Blackmore is going to interview Max, who, in inverted commas, miraculously survived five camps. Max. An SS brought me to Karlsruhe in a train, a prisoner train, which should bring about 900 prisoners to Sachsenhausen or on <laughs> An SS were looking for a place for only one person in, in it. And he opened the door and he kicked me in. And he said, to dirty, stinky Jew, you will never come back from this extermination camp of Sachsenhausen or Oranienburg near Berlin. And now 62 years are passed and I'm still alive and I'm happy to be with you this morning here <laughs> to tell you about what people can do and they have no right information, no right education. In ignorance, the people let themselves taken along in an ideology of Nazism and there they thought to improve their situation. But instead of improving it, he took the people now over 50 million who were killed, 4 million Jews. And I believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I believed that he is capable to do all uh, things what he likes to do. And why he lets now destroy the Jews, 4 million Jews were killed, and uh, 10 million others. So uh, I. Uh, was astonished as I found in this cell with me a man, the eyes were shining. He had hope. And he told me he's one of Jehovah's Witnesses, one from the city John, uh, students of the Bible, Bible student. I never heard about it. But I was very much impressed that people are on earth which really practice the two greatest commandments should love your Creator and your God with all your heart and mind and your neighbor as yourself. So I was impressed that people exist in all uh, our religion, also the Jews went in the war and conti continued to uh, kill one another and other people. So uh, he told me that uh, his wife was already taken away in Ravensbrück and there she died already. The five children were taken away in a re-education home like my wife Simon. And in spite his eyes were shining, satisfaction said he proves uh, the God of this world, the devil a liar, in keeping integrity. And I was handcuffed on him. As a Jew, I could run away. I had to listen to him. <laughs> and I had many questions. And he answered all my questions with the Bible. He knew it by heart. And that Joseph was rejected by his own brothers, which a story which I knew. And that I had to come back when Joseph had the means to survive. And many other things I learned from him on this way. And as we arrived after two weeks uh, in Sachsen, uh, the, the um, other politicians, communists, and they were isolated in prison in the camp. 
And the camp commander announced that everyone from about 30, 40,000 prisoners would talk with Jehovah's Witnesses. He would get 25 strokes for punishment. And this encouraged me in my mind and my heart. The Bible must be a very important book. When the Nazis hate that book, that is really important to know what is in it. So I was hungry and thirsty to get more knowledge. And in Sachsenhausen one day, the Jews, uh, there were very much uh, very bad treatment in sport. And uh, they call them Strafsport, and they want to punish them while they're Jews. I didn't ask to be born a Jew, but and I'm responsible. I came in the world like a colored boy, a colored girl, didn't choose the color or the the Sintis and the Bohemians, which were killed also six million. And so I couldn't understand that people can do such things. And they were isolated. And, and in this isolation in winter four, there was a very cold winter uh, with a water hose. They made them all wet and let them freeze outside. And there, 30% of the witnesses died also. Uh, this brother which uh, gave me the first information about the Bible, he died there. And I have still frost scars here from this time. We had to stay outside in the cold when one prisoner was missing, day and night outside in the cold, 5, 10, 15 below. We had to jump the whole <coughs> night, otherwise one which uh, wouldn't move, he would die. I saw people, the ears were falling off, the noses, the fingers, all were frozen. And one uh, an evening in Kapo from my barrack told me in the last barrack is another Lipschitz. So I, an evening I went there and I found my own father. The, the legs are all swollen. He couldn't move anymore. He was dying there. He put his hands up on my head and made no, a, a prayer prayer and the camp commander, the couple from the barrack told me, you can carry your own father's body to the crematory. As I got there on the crematory with my father on the back, the head behind the legs, I hold the legs, I saw hills of dead bodies, that more dead ones every day as they could burn in the crematory. And then uh, a few weeks later, 30 Jews were sent up to Neuengamme. There's a camp near Hamburg. We should enlarge the harbor there. And we were pushing the whole day the wheelbar, the transportation of sand. And there, the camp commander said, this 30 Jews we can send to Jehovah's Witnesses. There were 120 in the sand bar. And I was happy to get in contact with other witnesses. So there was a working camp, each one had his bed. Then in Sachsenhausen were four persons and one straw sack. For one person had been four, one had here and one had here, like the sardines. Many times arrived that people was dying and next to the body. Here yeah, each one had his bed and three uh, in large. And then the last one, where hands throw up, on one side, and I was on the other side. The heads were only about uh, 30, 40 centimeters distance. So every evening he was telling me about Bible stories. And I could see in this barrack was much cleaner, and the food was rightly distributed. And when one got weak, I gave him more food to help him to survive. And one witness uh, was raising rabbits in a racing uh, race for rabbits, and the rest of the peelings from the kitchen was brought over there. When one peeling was falling down, the prisoners was jumping out like chickens to get a uh, peeling for the potatoes. And he let me sometimes go in and get some rabbit's food. It was very good, and, and so I could keep on going in this time. And after some months, I was sent to Auschwitz, where I still have the number 
that number and arm, and in Auschwitz said, I want to exterminate all the Jews there. And in Auschwitz, uh, they sent me to Boot.